Um, so my name is Nia Phillips and I'm the head of Amelia Sales at Adam Matthew or AM and this is my colleague Emily um, and I'm opening the engagement team at AM. Um, perfect, so yeah, we've got a couple of questions to ask the panel so we're going to go through some questions and we'll definitely leave some time at the end if any of you have any questions. Um, I guess you guys want to get started and introduce yourselves? I'll, I'll go first. Um, uh, my name is Farzana Qureshi and I work at SOAS and I'm an Arts and Humanities Librarian and I look after a huge portfolio but I look after development studies, uh, literary, cultural studies, music and the Centre for Creative Industries, Media screen, screen Studies and I used to look after South Asia. I was a South Asianist for 10 years. Um, I'm Ed Holberton, I'm a Senior Lecturer in English Literature at the University of Bristol um, and I teach um, largely Shakespeare and Renaissance literature. Um, I'm Sarah Jones, I'm also a, uh, from the University of Bristol. I'm a lecturer in modern British history, which is a bit of a misnomer because I don't actually do that much modern British history, a bit of America, gender and sexuality studies, all of that kind of stuff. Um, I'm also director of exams for history and I'm kind of trying to lead conversations about kind of pedagogical practice uh, within the history department there. Uh, and I'm Catherine Robertson, I'm from the University of Birmingham. Uh, my job title is a uh, Library Engagement Advisor, uh, but previous uh, life was Subject Advisor, um, predominantly with History and English, uh, and now my, my college is, is Cal, and one of my sort of pet projects is looking at engaging students more with our resources. Perfect, thank you all for joining us. Um, so I suppose to get started, um, how many of your students know what a primary source is, or is familiar with using a primary source when, when they start? So maybe Sarah, if somebody comes to fix your undergraduate student, <laughs> <laughs> what um, is their experience? There's two answers to that. Uh, I mean, um, they do, and actually A-levels do set them up quite well in some ways. I've got lots of opinions about kind of the transition between school and university, which I'm happy to talk about, but they think they know what a primary source is, and they do have a kind of good level of skills around kind of like what I would consider fairly basic analysis, kind of critical analysis of that material. But actually a lot of what we end up doing is making them rethink what those sources are and how they might work with primary sources. There's a lot of um, trying to make good on what they already have, because they definitely do have skills, but also kind of pushing them to think in a slightly different way about the kind of material um, that they work with. So yes, they do know, but there is also lots of work to be done, and I'm not sure we ever really complete that even throughout a kind of full undergraduate degree, let alone in that kind of first year. So yes and no, which feels like a very historian answer to make, to be honest. <laughs> and is that a similar experience in, for English students? Or? I think less so in English. I mean, you know, we, we have a lot of students who've done history A-level, yeah. so, yeah. so those students would, would I think, have a, a clearer example, a clearer idea of it. Um, um, and I think, you know, as they read more bibliographies divided into primary and secondary, you know, they, they get familiar with that, that, um, that distinction. In, in our first year, one of the, I suppose one of the differences between doing English compared to when I did English um, as an undergraduate is that in lectures now we use so much more visual material drawn directly from, pro yeah. from primary sources, um, which encourage them to think about the material text a lot more than we did in my day, as it were. Yeah. So, I, so I think it kind of, you know, it, it comes in like that. Yeah. And it's not from when you're doing your library inductions with yeah. brand new students, kind of, what's their experience? I, I'd say it's patchy, yeah. and I think it depends on what discipline they're coming from. I think probably a little bit ahead if they've done history A-level. Um, I'm always promoting our, our primary resources, and um, I, think, um, I think it varies, and I think it depends if it's embedded, uh, to look at primary resources in the modules. We do have some. Uh, that, that look and work with um, colleagues in special collections. Um, but I, I, sometimes I find we, I do have to distinguish for them. Yeah. Do you think that varies quite a lot depending on the subject? That, that obviously you've looked after so many different subjects, but yeah. it does that vary quite a bit depending on... Yeah, absolutely. The whole arts, humanities, social science angle to it. Um, I think I find... I was, in fact, I gave a tour yesterday to a bunch of development study students and they were really curious to, to look at the special collections and look at the uh, protest literature that we've got. So I completely promoted it and I think they need to probably have more of a practical uh, hands-on session. We've got a very rich digital library, but I, I think it's quite hidden and I think that really needs to be more, far more exploited. Yeah. Kathleen, what things at Birmingham? How do you find... How, what do they know about primary sources when they start? 
Um, not a great deal. Um, I think they struggle a bit with the difference, um, you know, with using the catalogue versus using an archival catalogue. They don't really understand why they need to use two systems. Um, we're used to, I think, getting students who are very familiar with the idea of primary sources, but they've almost been told they're given something quite well known and given the analysis around, the, the, the kind of accepted analysis rather than what they think about it. So I think um, they can get a little bit nervous about having to interpret things their own way. So I think, you know, trying to get them to, to maybe look at some letters and then think, well, what are the other side like, etc. things like that, um, they're a little bit um, less comfortable with. Whereas if you give them something very familiar, they can, they can sort of trot off what, what they expect <laughs> you want to. Yeah, I was thinking about um, confidence as well of students. So even, you know, whether it's a physical collection or digital, we're talking about, you know, when they first come to university. Um, what do you think about their confidence in terms of perhaps, you know, during their journey through university with physical and digital? Do you think it, it grows? Um, Ed, I don't know if you want to... Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, I, yes, I think broadly it does grow. And I think, you know, I think we're, we're very aware now of, um, um, a part of our curriculum trying to kind of teach that as well and kind of build that confidence. Um, I mean, I think we've got, um, you know, we, I think we're working out ways, especially in our third year, which is deliberately a bit more kind of uh, research orientated, if you see what I mean, um, to, um, um, to kind of, yeah, build everyone's confidence, if you see what I mean, rather than just the top students who are looking forward to a kind of bit more kind of postgraduate level thing where th those kind of students often kind of um, in, by the third year, I have quite a lot of confidence to kind of go in, into archives, digital or, or otherwise. <coughs> yeah, um, it, it's no, it, I agree. It's 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 interesting because it's a it's slightly patchy even within a department. So we have colleagues in history who take our students into archives and get them working with kind of librarian and archivists to be able to kind of um, build that confidence. And actually, we find the ones that we do that with will be much happier having had a guide to then go and use that for their own kind of like independent research projects. But actually there is a real reluctance from students if they haven't had that kind of initial kind of introduction. We have the Feminist Archive South at Bristol and they will not go in there without that kind of first introductory kind of thing. They feel like they don't know what they're looking for. And so there's something there about kind of building their confidence and being a guide. And the digital collections, it's interesting because they're actually much more confident, I think, immediately. It feels much more like Google, I suppose, you know, kind of putting in a keyword and being able to respond to that material. While there's excellent kind of bits of that, I think it's really important that we give the same kind of critical introduction to those sources, because actually what we find, without kind of going off on a total tangent, we're doing research at the moment about the kind of transition from school to university, and the thing that we're finding is that they feel like they know how to apply knowledge, but not really how to acquire it when they arrive with us. So they are waiting for us to give them a list, a list of relevant facts, the way that they are given at A level. And actually, we don't do that because that doesn't exist, but they're constantly looking for that kind of list. And if you give them a, an online archive, sometimes they feel, my list. Do you know, I can, I can put my keyword in, and here is my list of relevant facts for my project. And actually, there's lots of more that goes into that process, and actually kind of teaching them, and almost, I don't want to make them less confident, that's not quite what I'm going for, but kind of, adding some nuance to that process is actually as difficult sometimes as building their confidence with the physical archive. So it's a difficult kind of balance in getting them to kind of engage with those materials in different ways. Sorry, that was a really long answer. No, no, good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I was just something we were going to ask is around sort of the methods and approaches that you're using, I suppose, from your perspective and from the library perspective, to introduce students. Is there, I'm sorry, obviously you're working quite a lot in this, in this area. Yeah, so I mean, we in first year, the uh, Bristol historians do a, you know, approaching the past, which is, you know, a grand, sad, you know, title for um, a kind of essentially a skills unit where they have to just do source commentaries. And it's about kind of working with a source uh, that we give them to start with, which doesn't quite knock them out of that, you know, here's a present for you kind of um, mindset. But by the end, they have to go and find their own, collect their own and analyze them together as a whole, contextualize that kind of material and turn that into a presentation, actually. So part of it is kind of unit level and assessment based in sort of pushing them to try and, and do this. But actually, I'm not 100% sure that we've quite kind of worked in how to do what I was just sort of talking about, how to kind of figure out that, um, sort of push them away from that. We're trying, we're playing with different forms of assessment. We're playing forms of different forms of kind of teaching in the classroom. But I think a lot of it is just actually turning 
critical use of archives, critical use of sources into the middle of units uh, and getting them to do that as part of their kind of everyday kind of courses. Part of that is engaging with libraries uh, and our wonderful subject librarian Bennett, who kind of helps us uh, with those things as well. So I could wang on for hours <laughs> about that, but I will, I, I will uh, call back. <laughs> Um, Prasanna, what about you from a, from a library perspective, thinking about the confidence and the methods? Is there anything, you know, do you have a surefire one-stop for everything, or is it more of a... Ooh, do you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, share. <laughs> it's more of a different approach, I guess, depending on the discipline and the level. I think it is, and I think um, we use a virtual learning environment, and a lot of the uh, resources that they need to access are, you know, the, the links are all embedded in there, and I think they are losing out on you know good you know proper research skills and i also <laughs> going to probably be a bit critical here of academics i was just talking with joe our special collections archivist that uh, we've got such a rich collection of resources and sometimes the academics don't use the resources that are on their doorstep mm -hmm. and are not as i say embedding it in the university uh, modules therefore how are students going to approach them and I think it is, they are nervous, definitely, I see it. Um, I, like I said, the, the students yesterday, there were development studies, they're actually year three students because they joined during the pandemic. So they wanted to know, and some haven't even entered the library. Because, and I said, ah, it's all on, mod, on, the, on Moodle, and they were like, yeah, and, and, and are nervous, I think. Uh, and now, now we know how to take out a book. It was like that. So um, it, how are they going to approach our rich collections? And, and I suppose it's just very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. We're just bombarded, it's that, uh, all that, you know, information traffic at the beginning of the year. And so I think it is definitely about liaising. I think pandemic, and we've had heavy restructures, that's all played a role. So I think it'd be great to build up those relations between Joe's fantastic team in special collections, the library staff, you know, we're a strong team of 10 librarians and the academics, but I, I think sometimes we're not on the same page. It's very patchy. And I run a lot of library and information skill sessions across my portfolio, but you know, and they're always ever so grateful and the students are just, they're just like, I didn't know that was there, I had no idea. And so I think it is a bit about marketing and just networking, working better, better relations. Yeah. Can I just speak to that? that yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> we're um, in the Shakespeare course or the kind of early modern literature course that I teach, we're on a bit of a learning curve in terms of precisely what you were just talking about, where I think the instinct of teachers is to say, just go and find out what you can about Renaissance stages or the Restoration stage, how it's different from Shakespeare's stage. Um, and you know, nine out of ten students will start and finish with Google at that point. And so, what you actually need is you need a much more kind of closed um, uh, task to say, go look in this database, look at all the words that you know, begin with <laughs> this, uh, and, 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 you know, and, and so if, if, if you, you need kind of coaching the students in particular databases, I found, sort of on our course, yeah. to, 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 to get most of the class doing the same thing. I think as well, like, um, uh, Pasana made a really good point about, you used the word overwhelmed, and that's what I think a lot, um, because I think, you know, certainly in our library, it's very easy to, you go in, you see the books, they're all the resource list books, so they use those, no problem, they can use the catalogue, but the digital collections aren't as visible. Our special collections are behind a desk. Mm -hmm. Our research reserve, you have to have a health and safety tool before you can go in. So they're, they're very small barriers, but they are barriers. Mm -hmm. And so I think that kind of sub sends out a message to particularly undergrads, you know, oh, it's not for you. It's too precious for you. Mm -hmm. And they kind of internalize that a little bit. Whereas um, I know now in history, for instance, um, they'll make sure that from the first year, they're getting students to talk to special collections. They're bringing special collections in and letting them handle them, being like, yes, you need to treat them with respect, but they are there to be used. They are not just these precious, revered things. You know, they're, they're very much um, things that we want them to engage with. But I think we, we kind of have to make the first step to make that happen a lot of the time. Yeah, making it as big for them. Absolutely. Do you think, um, you know, without risk of bringing this back to the pandemic, because I feel like so many, so many conferences and things are at the moment, do you think, um, you know, working from home, students being from home, do you think that's kind of stilted that then because they haven't been able to get into the library? Or do you think perhaps it's encouraged them to look at more digital sources where they perhaps wouldn't? Um, yeah, just interested to hear your thoughts. 
I think from our point of view, it's, it's sort of been a bit of a double-edged sword in that I think generally there's been um, good engagement because the um, uh, online one-to-ones and things like that have been much more accessible. The timings have been better for people who work or have caring responsibilities, etc. cetera, um, but they're not necessarily being able to physically come in. So it's, it's really trying to think about how you can engage someone with something that they can't physically touch yet. And for example, I was talking to one of our um, skills advisors who does this, this type of training at the minute. And um, she, she's been doing her own family history about a, a, a well-known um, uh, ancestor of hers. And she uses that as an example about the research she's done. And it kind of gets them thinking. Um, but without that kind of hook, either a physical thing or a real story, a real, you know, oh, that's why we care. Um, then, yeah, we find it, that is harder, I think, to, to engage. I think it's also a little bit trickier. We're finding, I'm not sure what it's like in, in English, but talking to colleagues at other kind of institutions, that actually engagement, student engagement generally is dipping. dipping that they are less engaged than they were pre-pandemic. Um, we can't quite figure out why. Um, but there does seem to be something around kind of the mitigations that were put in place, the distance, um, the kind of lack of just being in a room and being encouraged to talk, kind of being able to turn your camera off. So there's something about that that we haven't quite kind of figured out. And actually, I think, going back to kind of your point about kind of this, like barriers, things that didn't even seem like barriers before now seem like barriers. There's even more barriers to sort of stopping them kind of going in and engaging with that kind of material. We also, I'm not sure whether this is a kind of sector-wide issue, we made lots of things more accessible for them. We gave them more, so sort of took out some steps for them, provided them with more than perhaps we would have provided them in the past because, of course, they could not go and do those things. So actually, we took out some of the skills, perhaps, that we would have encouraged students to kind of develop before because we were trying to make things easier, quite rightly, in the middle of all of the chaos. So actually, we haven't quite got back to a point yet, talk, uh, kind of your point as well, about pushing them to do that and kind of making those connections with the librarians. We haven't put all of those back in place yet. So actually, there's this slowdown we're finding anyway with students engaging with that kind of um, material and with their courses generally. The enthusiasm to go above and beyond has, in my experience at least, dipped quite substantially. I mean, I think that to end on a positive note, one of the, th I mean, I agree with everything yeah. you said completely, <laughs> and I've noticed the same things. Um, but the, um, I think the op one of the opportunities from the pandemic was in terms of the lecture as a format and breaking that down. I mean, we, I mean, I, I think it was, went through the whole of Bristol, wasn't it? That yeah. Yeah. we were under strict instructions to chunk our lectures down to about 20 minutes. Yeah. And what that meant was that you could take a standard one hour lecture and chunk it into smaller bits with little interactive bits in the mm -hmm. middle. And I think that that produced a much better format for that kind of learning where you could say, OK, now I want you to, you know, go and look this up. And, you know, and, and so that I think pedagogically, that's like an opportunity that we can kind of take forward. I agree. Mess up that kind of yeah. slightly traditional structure a little bit, do some more interesting things with it. A lot more primary source work, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Although the students now want to go back into the chores. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they want to go back to the hour. Very and actually, of, like, yeah, video yeah. stuff. And like, I understand oh, for the kind of co the cohort, the connection, <laughs> yeah, you can understand, but yeah. pedagogically you are kind of like, really? <laughs> <laughs> and you were talking a bit before about kind of task setting and kind of getting, rather than the sort of broad <coughs> strokes, kind of giving students more specific tasks. Could you not share some of the examples of the types of things that you've been doing? Um, yeah, so we, I mean, oh, where to start? We, um, we've got, um, we're working out how to assess this. And I think assessment's kind of like a really important part of sort of generating student engagement. Um, and so, so that's going to be key. We've got one assessment where um, we, asked, we asked them to edit a small chunk of a Shakespeare play. Um, and so what we're doing is we're putting, to, we're giving them some kind of quarto, bits of quarto texts. Um, and the idea there is that they, um, develop a sense of a, of, of a Shakespeare play as a kind of a fluid thing that where there's no kind of one text in a way. Um, the results of that, have, we, we're getting there. Uh, <laughs> um, we've got some really interesting additions sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but there we kind of, you know, we, we, we get them to look at things like prompt books and think of them, you know, think about what a, a text for readers is and a text for performance is and how they might want to kind of make different decisions when they're putting together their, um, their, their, their editions. I also convene a course uh, on literature and enslavement, um, which is a, a fairly new thing. Um, and my colleague John McTague does a really great seminar there where he looks at some, um, um, well, he starts it off with looking at some, uh, in the classroom, looking at some 
um, some classified adverts from the 18th century, um, which um, are like a book that on one page include like a book sale, um, some adverts for runaway servants, and an advert for a runaway uh, enslaved boy, um, and some adverts for some runaway horses. Um, and it's a really kind of striking page, you know, really disturbing page to look at when you kind of realise what these things are. Um, and just to kind of, in the classroom, kind of compare the different kinds of language and the different kinds of framing um, there. So in a way, that's a kind of a classroom exercise that works. Um. Yeah, that was really powerful. I imagine the students are reacting quite strongly to that. Yeah. Susanna, you mentioned some kind of the information literacy courses and skill sessions that you do. What kind of, what does that kind of entail? I know when we met a few days ago, you were kind of talking about, your, you know, get everyone in the room and get them on and get them using it. How's it? Yeah, it depends on how much time the academics give me. Yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of the skill sessions are now becoming embedded, which is brilliant. I'm really pleased. Um, and so they'll say you have the whole two hours. And I usually use about an hour, hour and a half. I try and keep a presentation about 40 minutes. And I run through all the resources, how to use the library, everything you need to know as a, as a first time you know, uh, visitor or, uh, of, of using the resources. And then I try and do a hands-on. So I, I've done treasure hunts in the library, you know, proper <laughs> library quizzes. And then other ones where you know, it's just, um, I, I set up a quiz. And, um, and sometimes just fire questions as well. And then we give prizes. And I think they always enjoy that. They get a bit nervous when they have to get their devices out and start doing it. But then they, they quite enjoy. So we're really, you know, I don't know if the words were forcing, but making them you know, look at the collectors, look how to find resources across across the pages. Um, I just want to say quickly, when you were talking about the pandemic, I think at SOAS um, it was an advantage and a disadvantage. I think the advantage was that so many uh, publishers and suppliers were obviously making a lot of their resources free. So I think that made the students use those platforms and engage with them more. And some of them, you know, were absolutely desperate to get to that resource. So I think we made them freely available, as in, I mean, resources did uh, the publishers, but also they had to look at other avenues mm -hmm. to try and get to the resource because they couldn't get to the physical book now or the physical special collections. So I think it did allow them to, you know, use alternative skills. And I think that was an advantage. And we were running again, a lot of remote library information skill sessions. So they, we were always there. Um, but of course, the, the limitation was that they couldn't get to practical, and sometimes a lot of material, especially uh, catalogues, art catalogues, were, were were not digitized. So, you know, they had to make do with something else. Yeah, yeah it's, it's tricky, isn't it? And I think, yeah, for most people who, who we speak to, there are definitely advantages and disadvantages to that as well. Catherine, what about you and kind of your experience with, um, yeah, showing students the ropes, I guess, and perhaps a little bit how that changed as well, being online. Well. I think for us, um, we would always do um, same as you really, you know, in conjunction with academics, we find um, embedded has a much greater success rate than, you know, the workshops are popular, but embedded, they know for sure it's going to be relevant, so they come. Um, we started last year um, with our dissertation students, we wanted to focus a bit more on um, primary materials. So this year, uh, as you know, in a couple of weeks, uh, we've got um, during our uh, academic writing week, which is you know when the students are traditionally doing their research for history, we've been working very closely with the school, and we've got um, basically five um, events. So it's, it's laid out so that on the Monday, um, our skills advisor will do a session um, with the academic that the academic set up, um, which will be your normal how to research, how to use um, you know online resources, how to do things for your dissertation. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, um, at the same slot online uh, we've invited um, publishers in such as Adam Matthew um, to do um, a talk about their specific primary source materials and then on the Friday same slot um, we have the academic and the skills advisor in a room in the school where students can come and ask any questions that have come up over the week um, and this is the first time we've run a whole sort of week's worth of events um, but we're hoping the sign-up will be good because we make it look as compulsory as we can without it being <laughs> compulsory. <laughs> so the academic creates the event, advertises it for us, um, but the content is created by us and the publishers. Um, but as I say, last year we did a very, very soft launch just working with one publisher. Um, and we had, I think, 40 attendees, um, which again, for something very, we didn't really advertise it. They're good numbers, you know, for, for what is equivalent to a half term week, you know. Um, so the students definitely engaged. So that's why we rolled it out a bit more. Um, but that's the kind of thing 
I think we want to do because the bonus as well for the library is that our skills advisor then has more time to focus on you know things like national archives or small publishers that normally you know in a 40 minute session you're not going to get to them um, and it means that the publishers can speak about their material with a much higher in-depth knowledge than you know our librarians would, would ever hope to have so we'll be gathering feedback um, but yeah history are very excited about it and we're very excited so I'm hoping we'll get good numbers um, and that's online partly because it worked well um, you know in the pandemic partly because we can record it um, so that students who can't attend can watch it and partly because it is in skills week so they can go home if they want to <laughs> yeah you won't be forcing them so yeah exactly <laughs> exactly um, yeah thinking about that kind of skills week we were thinking about um, what types of skills do you think um, are most important for students to learn um, when using primary sources whether that's physical or digital um, and yeah start with that one <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. Uh, I mean, I, that's it. I found that quite a, a tricky question, really, because I mean, it's through primary sources that I think his, history students, maybe in particular, it's all, all of the skills we want them to have. It's analysis, it's kind of making arguments, kind of building evidence. Um, it's, it's all of that kind of intellectual stuff that we're trying to get them to do consistently. We mostly do that through an engagement with primary materials, uh, or at least a combination of kind of primary and, and secondary, or the blurry lines between them. So everything is a, a kind of a slightly glib answer, but and that kind of, I do think there's something specifically about there are changes to the way that academia and kind of that we're teaching after kind of uh, the pandemic. But I think just generally over time, we are moving more online. We also use kind of a of VLE and everything is very blackboard based. You know, this is the shift that is happening, obviously, and has been happening for a long time. But in some ways, some of my, let's go with more traditional colleagues, uh, are perhaps stuck in a way of thinking about kind of material and how you, you know, you, the old uh, debates about should we allow laptops in class are still circulating and are quite frustrating because actually for the vast majority of us, we are, uh, doing more interesting things in the classroom with kind of, um, digital resources so a task to go back to kind of the question about tasks as well something I do is I ask different groups to answer the same question but using a different keyword in the same database so they all have to kind of think and actually you'll find that they'll get very very different answers and actually that's less about them finding content and more about them realizing or thinking critically about how they are using the resources that they use without much sort of thought. So actually a lot of kind of what we're doing towards with the kind of digital, I totally forgot what the question is, so sorry. Um, <laughs> but a lot of what we're doing with the digital is kind of, uh, yeah, making think, what was the question? Let me just check, skills. skills. Yes. <laughs> so in part, it's about kind of the digital skill and kind of thinking about the archives. That wasn't a totally uh, off, uh, off shoot question, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great, Sarah. And do you want to? Yeah, um, I mean, I can't add much to that. Um, I think I think thinking about um, um, the way in which literary texts are mediated and remediated is, is kind of quite key. I mean, Martha touched on this at the beginning. I think that, that that's a kind of, you know, that's that's something where we can say what we are doing is actually kind of preparing them for for the world we live in. And um, I've got colleagues who you know who talk who are really good digital humanities colleagues who are really good at talking about how databases. The history of particular databases, stuff that I'm, I'm not so clear on, but like I've got a colleague who kind of introduces how Ebo came about um, as a database and, and it's kind of blind spots. And I think stuff like that is really, really important to teach that, that things that appear to be transparent windows onto the world aren't necessarily. Um, <clears throat> um, and also thinking about kind of how material um, or, it, or digital forms um, kind of shape information. Um, so one of my classes, we look at some commonplace books. I don't know if people know what a commonplace book is, is um, and, and how, and, and just kind of think about how poetry might have been read in kind of Shakespeare's time, where you know, digest poems into little bits and kind of collect them under headings, and we do a little bit of that ourselves in terms of how, and thinking about how that might have actually kind of gone back into the way that sonnets were written and things. So we kind of try and, yeah, try and think about kind of form in that way and mediation. <coughs> We talked a little bit about kind of some of the challenges and kind of getting students to use those. When you do get students to use primary sources, kind of what do they say? Are they excited about it? We've had you know, some students who said, you know, I'm doing history, I'm a real historian. Kind of is that some of the, the sort of excitement that, that you guys see when you're doing some of your, your you know, your tasks or kind of with, with students in the library? 
and you're doing some yeah. there. So no, do I think, yeah, I think, and when it happens, it's really, it, yeah, it's really like exciting because you just got, you see it click. You almost see like the moment when it's like, oh, and I can see all of this, you know, without even leaving, you know, blah, blah, blah. And um, yeah, it's just really, really interesting. And I think they tend to be the ones, um, I mean, it was a long time ago now, but I remember, you know, helping one dissertation student with finding some primary material that she, you know, she didn't know existed. And, you know, she thanked me in her acknowledgements, you know, and it was really lovely um, because, and I think that's, it's 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 easy for us because we do these things day in day out and you're kind of like oh well, you know that was I found that in one search but it's it's like magic to them and so you know when you see that click you just think gosh you know that that's that's a whole door opening um, you know to a whole different world of research because um, I think someone was saying earlier you know it's like with the records it opens doors it opens um, you know different options and they won't stop you know they'll keep questioning keep exploring and I think often it's just that that first hurdle. Um, I mean, then slightly back on the last question as well, I was thinking um, when you were talking about comparing things. Um, so with our newspaper archives, for instance, we had a, a very strong holding, you know, like Guardian, The Times, etc., etc. And then somebody requested that we buy um, the Daily Mail. Um, and it got the most um, positive feedback that we'd ever had for anything. Uh, but also academics from other departments basically saying, I can't believe we're, <laughs> I cannot believe we're spending money on the Daily Mail. But the point is that it's really important, you know, what's missing, what's, you know, how is this being done? Can we compare these both to, you know, the New York Times? What is going on? Um, and just to really make them, um, uh, you know, I think, as, again, as how Lucy was saying, was, you know, look at it as an object, not just the words, but what is this? What's going on behind it? Um, and again, when you see that click, it's, um, yeah, it's really exciting. Yeah, Fasana, I imagine you have some of those light bulb moments when you're doing things like your treasure hunts and showing them the, the things in the library. Um, yeah, what's your experience when students have that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it feels really positive and you think, okay, I've done something great today, uh, you know, <laughs> in my role. But I think for us as subject librarians and regional librarians, um, a big part of our job is to empower the students with knowledge and making collections and resources, you know, uh, um, accessible. So um, we run a lot of one-to-one -one research library appointments. Um, I'm giving one this Thursday. He's actually a PhD student for music, and he's told me he's dyslexic. So he actually managed to get through his whole master's without using the library. He relied on other friends and and peers to to get access, but he's now determined to try and use the library and do a lot of literature searching. So I think, um, like I said, a big, big part of our job is, is showing the breadth of the collection and using primary and secondary resources. Also, the PhD students, I think we've abandoned this idea. We used to get you to fill up a researcher postcard and you'd put your, you know, your abstract and then um, the collections you're interested in. And if it, you know, it had a tick for archives, and then we used to write an email to them, encouraging them to come for an appointment and to go to special collections. So the, most of the students took, took the offer up. They would go, they would, um, you, know, you know, look at, browse the library catalogue and the uh, archive catalogue. And I'd always get feedback in those one-to-one -one sessions. Um, but still, I feel a bit patchy. Um, and I think we need to just bridge that gap. But yeah, yeah, still, it feels great when students do come away. And I always love in those appointments if I find, especially those very niche subjects they're doing and we can't find anything, if I can come away with at least a couple of new resources, you know, I'm very happy and they're very happy and then you feel, yeah, yeah, and it feels really empowering. Mm -hmm. With those, oh, no, sorry, you, you go on. No, no, I was just gonna say, you can teach analysis, you can teach argument, but you can't teach passion mm -hmm. and you can't teach curiosity. Mm -hmm. And actually, some, and I think kind of giving them the breadth and actually introduce them to things. And sometimes the thing that gets them, you think, really? You know, <laughs> uh, out of all of the stuff that we've given you, that's the one that kind of, but it's not me to say, you know, whatever it is. Uh, but there's something about that. And I think actually kind of, I try to introduce them to, in some ways it's as much as possible because you never know what the hook is gonna be. And it could be something very different, something that feels urgent or interesting or pressing to them. It was not going to be the same thing that feels urgent or pressing or interesting to me. And that's not my job. It's not my job to teach them what to think or what to be interested in, but to you know, give them the tools and to give them kind of leads and guides you know, to, to find their own interests. And I think I'll, secondary can do that and like finding ideas and debates. History is sort of nothing without that, but it's also nothing without the material and you know falling down the rabbit hole of the sources and getting lost in an archive like I don't think anyone would be a historian if they didn't do at least a little bit of that every now and then. C can I just say as well I think one aspect that I really love is when I do those one-to-one -one research appointments I'm not an expert 
in their subject matter. They're not a, an expert in what my field is. And it's always lovely that we learn from each other. I absolutely love the research topics they're doing. And I then find new resources, new databases, new other external libraries. And I, I love that. I come away usually learning something new, some new theory or fact or, you know. So that's, that's a very exciting and stimulating aspect, I think, for them and us. So, yeah. I mean, we're talk, thinking about passion, I suppose, um, we, something that works really well at MA level that we've, um, it, it's the kind of, the, uh, the more material um, kind of aspect of kind of what, what we're teaching there. And um, we've actually got a, um, so, so, so some of the students come into special collections and they get to kind of handle kind of really old books. Um, we've also got a printing press which through a mixture of kind of serendipity uh, and really hard work on the basis of <laughs> <laughs> some of my colleagues, um, we've, we've reassembled, we've collected and reassembled this kind of reproduction of an 18th century printing press. It's currently in the basement of um, the English department, but the ambition longer term is to put it in the new library that, that one day, <laughs> one day, 2040 maybe, <laughs> um, is, um, is going to be built. Um, and so the Arts and Social Sciences Library, and the, the ambition is to have a maker space in there that will actually kind of bring into contact um, the information and the kind of the process of making books, archives, and so on. Um, and so and so I suppose the challenge is to get some of that kind of postgraduate level enthusiasm for the kind of material text into kind of undergraduate teaching a bit more. And you know, some, some undergraduates obviously respond to that, but it's not the hands-on stuff, learning how to print things and so on. It's not something we can really do at scale at the moment. Yeah. That's really cool. I, love that. <laughs> I know. I think it sounds amazing. Um, and I know, uh, Sarah, you mentioned Ben um, earlier, your subject librarian, and I mean, obviously, Dane, you know, English, because how are you kind of working with the library um, at Bristol? Yeah, I mean, um, we work, it, coming back to kind of your point, it's actually some members of staff do that quite a lot and I work quite closely with Bennett, but also kind of um, the special collections kind of folks and um, the sp specific archives like the Feminist Archive South, uh, they're great and they're obviously so, I'm preaching to the choir here, but so sort of willing and, and helpful and uh, to kind of help set up sessions to kind of to really introduce students to that I'm doing a new special field about kind of sex and print culture next term and they've been marvelous at kind of setting it up uh, but I do think it is an under underdone thing sometimes and I know that's partly about the kind of collections that we have and it's easier sometimes to kind of um, integrate things like special collections into teaching if there is a fantastic archive that is directly relevant to you <laughs> it's obviously a, like a, a nice way to do it but um, for me it's, it's if my ultimate slightly blue sky optimistic aim is to turn my undergraduates into at least semi-confident historians working with archivists and working with librarians is part of that process so it feels to me like a holistic kind of thing that they should be should be doing and i'm not sure that it always is the case i think as well like we, we focus i mean i mentioned history a lot because that's there are sort of primary primary source users but we also um in the library we, we kind of approach it from the other side as well and that we'll um look at rather than working with an academic will you know there's an event there's a i don't know women in stem day it's like right what can we what you know archive can we talk about and you know we've obviously been working with adam matthew to, to get some tweets together and things like that to promote an archive but without necessarily an audience in mind other than just our students or anyone following our, our twitter account um you know just to sort of again spark that interest about you know you don't know what you don't know um and to, to just yeah get people thinking and and, and looking at at different ways rather than kind of what they think they should be interested in you know I'm a historian and I'm doing modern history therefore I will only look at these things you know but actually there's there's all sorts of things so we're trying to yeah look at the resources we have as well and see what we can how we can sort of pin those at key points to catch their attention um, to see what else we have um, you know that they might not know they're even interested in which is you know that's quite fun <laughs> and it can be frustrating actually when students um, say oh I really want to do an essay on X there's just no resources and think, <laughs> oh, that, that feels improbable. Like, uh, and then you'll be like, have you spoken to Bennett? And they'll be like, who's Bennett? And then, and then you introduce them and they'll be like, did you know we have this amazing person who's willing to have these conversations? Like, yes, I did, yes. Uh, you know, like, and this is this, you know, yes, did you know? But actually it's strange that, I'm not sure whether it's a Bristol issue or whether, but uh, having worked in other places, it would suggest it's not, but actually sometimes um, as academics or departments we're not always very good at kind of 
actually something I think that COVID did help because we wrote down a lot of kind of processes and we wrote down a lot of guides to doing things. And I think actually that's pushed students towards things that have long been there, but perhaps we haven't always articulated in ways that felt kind of clear or accessible to them. Um, but yeah, you know, when you kind of get it in there, all of this magical stuff happens, but sometimes they, they miss the, the breadcrumbs to get them. I'm not going to follow that metaphor. Because we have such um, such limited time. Yes. You know, oh, how do you, how do you yes. pick what you're going to do with your 45 yeah. minutes? Yeah. How do you pick yeah. the, the best ones, inverted commas? It's really hard, mm, which, again, is, I think, why we sort of use the social media, so they kind of trip over it almost. <laughs> <laughs> just put it in their path and hope that they notice, you know. Um, we might discuss this later as part of the room, but, yeah, I'm interested now to hear more about the promotion of primary sources. I know you mentioned one-to-ones, social media. Do you tell them then to follow the, the accounts of the history department or the library? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, we, we work with... Um, so we have um, student engagement um, officers in each school, so we work very closely with them and send them basically what we're sending out on social media so that they can amplify on their own social medias because to be honest the students are more likely to follow their departmental things than ours but if they we find we get a lot more interactions if they retweet or re-share whatever and again partly because they see it as more relevant coming from a, a peer rather from a central um, institution um, so yeah we do a lot of that um, again yeah one-to-ones um, crop up. Um, we have um, at the minute we've created a new subgroup which is the collection, <laughs> Collections Engagement and Promotions Working Group. <laughs> we, do, we do love a long title and acronym <laughs> at Birmingham um, and uh, that's basically involved in uh, that was looking at um, less well used resources um, as well, primary resources in particular because we were finding that you know somebody would really champion a resource and then within maybe seven or eight years they've moved on, totally, understandably nobody stays there forever uh, but then there's nobody really shouting about it and so it just quietly drops off the radar and we can see that in some of our usage statistics whereas you know we're thinking well we've already paid for this we need to you know keep this um, you know in the in the consciousness at least and obviously new academics coming in you have your meeting with them but you can't cover everything so some things just inevitably just quietly sort of drop and we don't want them to because people will still be interested so it's really just sort of trying almost like um, plate spinning you're trying to keep everything <laughs> vaguely in the academic consciousness i think yeah so to promote resources oh there'll be a range of things so we do use social media a lot so we've got a library twitter feed so that's very active um, we're on mailing group lists and i'm constantly sending things to academics and students and also we've got quite a few niche resources, being the School of Oriental African Studies, for example, we run a music module, I look after music uh, on, specifically it's on Indian and Pakistani classical music, and we have got a resource, we're the first, quite proud of this, in the world to have it, it's a streaming, it's like Spotify, but it's, it's specifically, uh, it, if you're familiar with Alexander Street Press um, resources, it's very like, like that. Um, so this is specifically a streaming service of Indian classical music, because there's a module that we teach, so we work together with the person who d d devised this. He's super excited because the only place it was running was, was retail stores in Lahore in Pakistan. They were playing the music. So he wanted to get an academic uh, you know, angle on it. And he's so excited. So I got him now to promote it, uh, to do you know, a, a, an actual video. And I'm going to run, we run something called library surgeries every now and again. And so I'm going to get him to come in and meet the students to to promote this resource because we've purchased it. It's quite inexpensive actually, but we worked with him, negotiated, but I just don't want it to sit there. I want it to make sure it gets, you know, promoted, exploited and used across the school. So yeah, we, and our, we're running library information skills, one-to-one -one research appointments and just getting the academics on board really. They, when the students start, they're constantly go see Frazana, have a session, look at the resources. So. There's various ways, and I think on, we're all on board with that as a team. We're really active about that. Yeah. That sounds great. Um, we've got a few minutes left. I don't know whether we've got any more questions or whether we want to break it up to the room. Yeah, if anybody has any questions that they'd like to put to the panel, please, yeah, I'd love to have questions in the room. Can I have a quick question? Well, it's probably a really big question as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm Deborah Wilson. I'm a subject of brain for history at Queen's University. And I'm academic. My background, academic background is history. And when I came to this job, one thing I noticed was students weren't using physical archives. They were using online. And I, I did my PhD using physical archives. What is your take, all of you, what is your take on that gap between 
where many, and this is digitally, in a digital native document, these are scanned copies. A lot of the skills we need to use them are how we use physical archives. So what is your take on that and how to introduce that type of learning to a student using online resources? question. <laughs> uh, I think it's difficult. I think it's perfectly possible for them. It depends on their level of like ambition. I suppose it pushes them towards, like, using online archives I found sort of pushes them towards particular kinds of projects on particular kinds of topics doing particular kinds of thinking. And actually what you miss, the kind of materiality sometimes is we're missing that kind of work. So we're having, we're seeing fewer projects where they'll talk about the kind of materiality of objects. Mm -hmm. We are getting a push actually now. They're starting to kind of, in some ways, go back. We're seeing a lot more interest. At Bristol, we have a practice-based dissertation as well. And they're interested in things like curating exhibitions and actually bringing things out of archives. and put it. They're interested in that process themselves. So there's something about the shift, the gap, which, as a historian, I have thoughts of. But actually, as, a kind of, as an educator, I think it's pushing them sometimes in interesting directions or can at least push them into a direction or make them engage with physical archives in different ways to perhaps they did before but I think something is lost I think something has sort of gone a little they don't even things like we work with them um, Tijuana Bibles they're these kind of small pornographic kind of things but they're tiny and they're cheap and actually you learn something from that that they're meant to go in like a man's pocket for when he's on the train or you know uh, uh, but actually you kind of miss that because w w they're blown up in these beautiful images but you miss the size you miss the feel you miss all of that kind of stuff and it, and actually other than finding physical versions and bring them into the classrooms which sometimes we try to do try to do an exercise with Tijuana Bibles because um, I bought a few on eBay and um, where we show them scans and we make and actually have a conversation about the gaps between the two but it adds an extra layer of things to do when you have the time. So something is lost, but there are opportunities, is my short, not so short answer. Yeah, I mean, I recognise everything you're saying there completely. I mean, I think that's maybe, maybe at MA level, we kind of talk about those differences kind of in more depth. Um, but there's always an element of shock when they actually see books that they're used to seeing on the, on the screen kind of, as you say, they're just tiny, some, some of them, like a yeah. Renaissance to a decimo, you know. Um, <clears throat> so we have the same thing. Um, I mean, one, one, one thing that digital does make possible, though, going back to the kind of Shakespeare idea, is that you, know, the, you have now resources where you can go to the Internet Shakespeare website and see something that looks like a kind of normal text, normal text that they're familiar with, and then kind of click through to seeing actually how this looked on the page. Mm -hmm. so, so digital does sometimes provide that kind of transition from, OK, it's still digital, but something a bit more like yeah. the material experience. Let's them do it at scale too, right? Being yeah. able to kind of look across, you know, sitting in a in the British Library, going through the micro feature, you know, and try. They miss the context of what an individual art, uh, article might have looked like on the page, but they can study fifty of them in a way that would have taken them yeah. weeks or months to find. So their projects have changed. What they see as what they should be doing as history is almost broader because they have access to larger amounts of material. But actually, it's sometimes tougher to push them to depth because. Yeah. I think on, on a sort of practical level um, as well, like where I was talking about barriers earlier, um, one of the things we used to do, or I used to do when I used to do the dissertation sessions for history was um, when they would, um, uh, you know, have to sign in, um, I would get them to tick a box to see if they wanted to book in for a tour of our research reserve because they have to have their health and safety. It's not quite archives, but it is a, a kind of separate area. And a lot of them would, and I found that there was such a difference between getting them straight after I'd done the talk about how great it was, you know, tick, I can take you tomorrow and then you can have full access. They would do it versus getting them to sign up later. It would massively drop. So I think, you know, tying and just getting in, getting them in there um, is mostly the battle um, for me. And I think even just sitting here thinking now, I'm thinking, oh, the sessions I'm doing in a couple of weeks, I need to add that in and add in an option to get them into special collections. Again, just to, because I, I do feel, yeah, that, it, it, yeah, just getting them in there is <laughs> it's kind of the, the main thing for us. And, and once they're in, then like you say, they can, it, yeah. it strikes them about the size and the, the you know, the difference in color or, or whatever. It's, I was just thinking um, in terms of the digital library as an online resource, uh, I think it has, as I say, pluses and minuses. I mean, 
a lot of the images, the resolution, it, it, it's actually, it's a bit like going from a black and white picture and adding colour. Um, I do think that a lot of our students do like to see those visual bright images. I know it's not in their hand. So I think to me, that's the advantage of having uh, our digital library. Also, of course, if you're remote access, you know, around the world, you can access this uh, uh, from a click. So um, I think um, I think perhaps the digital library needs to be uh, more honoured and, and added to reading lists, like look at these images. That's actually something worth thinking about, getting our academics to d direct you direct to the digital library. That would get people more uh, interested, enthusiastic about, you know, primary sources, but, you know, digitised. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's a bit of food for thought. <laughs> yeah, the accessibility that you mentioned is, is really important. Sorry, sorry, you're nodding there. Like, you, you can't sorry, Yeah, yeah, I mean, screen readers and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, we've seen more ambitious projects from students with different sort of um, considerations taken into account than perhaps we would have in the past because they've been able, so it's not just the scale, it's also the support that comes with, um, with those kinds of things. So yeah, I think there is a real accessibility thing that students notice, which is yeah. nice. We've got about five minutes. Oh, perfect. Just really um, I was just going to say, in addition to the great work you're clearly all doing on the ground, um, we at National Archives run a series of training workshops called PASS, the, it's Postgraduate Archival Skills and Training Workshops, um, and we have three levels, um, sort of a, a fairly general overview, which is aimed at kind of final year undergrads and people who are thinking about postgrad, and then we've got more in-depth skills and methodologies, and then very, very specific, deeply nerdy workshops about particular record series based on who's, which staff are running those. So if you do have students, who are getting to grip with those original skills. We run them on site and online, so it might be worth pointing them to, to those workshops if that's useful. And they're open to anyone. You don't have to be affiliated to a, a university, though obviously lots of the students who come are, but for people who are thinking about starting postgrad, perhaps after a gap from time in study, those can be, well, the feedback we get suggests those are quite helpful for people. Could you just repeat what that's called? It's called PAST. So if you search for National Archives PAST, um, it should come up, or I can search it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that a new initiative, or we've been running that? 2013 was the first one, and that was AHRC funded. I know because I attended it when I was a PhD student. <laughs> <laughs> it's now not funded anymore, but we've kept it going and sort of established it. And then during the lockdowns, we moved it online. So, I mean, one of the big appeals to you in person is the handling documents and seeing that around context, but we do offer the online opportunity now for those that can't make it to queue uh, because of public transport or just having to get to queue across yeah. the country. Uh, but yes, so we're, <laughs> it's been running for a while, but it's still some of the sort of more specific courses have only run this year. So I did an early modern legal one this year. That was the first time we've run that because we saw the need for these more specialist yeah. training yeah. sessions. I've got one coming up on life course tracing aimed at actually sociology and criminology students because people want to study people's lives in depth and no one teaches how to use the census and civil registration and parallel resources to trace people through time. Um, so, yeah, yeah, try and put that. Can I, just, sorry, can I ask, sorry, has there been quite an uptake for the online more than, you know, the physical because you're saying a bit of obstacle to come here or... Yes, but I think people, if they can get here, would still prefer, prefer to, yeah. because it is a very different be seeing the original document. And, okay. and also part of it is just learning how to order documents or get a reader's ticket here, and that was always a big part of it as well. So Because it's the first time you attend or go to an archive as a student, it's very intimidating. So we sort of <laughs> talk you through that very basic bit of how you get into the reading room to even get a document. So I think that they appreciate almost as much as the documents themselves. Because we're so early in the academic year, I think I noticed this more than that from than anywhere else, because Dan and I both work across the floors here. Um, we've got a lot of newbie PhD researchers in at the moment who are presented with their document bowls and they look absolutely terrified. And they'll come to the desk and say, but how do I get out of the box? Yeah. And it's like, okay, let's talk you through. It's like, you're fine, you are, you are welcome to be here. You know, you are allowed to come in, you are allowed to touch documents, that's fine, let me show you how to do that safely. Um, so yeah, yeah, good, so good supervisors will come with their students, yeah. but we do get a lot of people, the students coming up to the desk going, my supervisor has sent me here. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, oh, okay. I guess there's no barriers that we were talking about earlier, just the practicalities that people might want. Because this is a big concrete hulk, and 
and people look at it and think that is not for me, but it absolutely is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think we've got three minutes left, so Claire, did you have a question? Yes, um, Claire from Special Collections at Leeds. Um, when, during lockdown, we, once we realised it was going to last more than you know, a couple of weeks, we suddenly thought, how do we keep that connection with the academics which, who were using Special Collections material and teaching seminars in our space? So we offered them free di digital images. Well, we'll digitise the material you want to use, or we'll join your virtual session with a desktop visualiser and show the material live. And it was about a 50-50 uptake. And it was really interesting because they all came back to us and went, but they don't get the materiality. It just doesn't come across, even with the live feed. We are turning pages, that did help a little bit more. But the other thing it didn't do was get the students in the door. It didn't break down any of those intimidation factors. So um, since we've been coming back and teaching back on site, uh, that was the big thing, it's like, we need to break down all of those barriers. Um, we got rid of a door, that was a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> we literally came with a barrier. We made it look more welcoming. But um, we, we, for the first time, um, one of our history academics managed to get a first year undergraduate module um, that had every single student in the special collections. And we gave them a range of material from the 1400s to the 1980s. And then it's that, the look on their faces of, I'm allowed to touch it. <laughs> yeah, yes, you are. And we did put some digital stuff up on a screen at the same time. Um, and that's one of the biggest questions we get is, well, isn't it digitised? <laughs> no. <laughs> Give me lots of money, we'll digitise it all. But, um, there, so I think there's an expectation, perhaps, that we just can't meet, of being able to digitise everything. But... If we do digitise a lot of it, they lose that materiality and they also lose the fear of walking through the door. Like you say, they just don't know they're allowed in, they don't know how to get stuff out of the box. So I think it's a really hard balance to find enough to get them online and searching. But how do you get them to go, that primary resource is really useful, can I find more of it that's not digital? And Getting them to make that journey, I think, is where we struggle. That's a very interesting point to perhaps ponder over lunch. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we're just about a half hour. So, um, thank you very much, um, all of you, for that. That was fascinating and really, really useful. Um, we've got about an hour now for lunch. Um, so, yeah, we'll break into the this afternoon for some more interesting panels. So, yeah, thank you very much, John. Thank you so much.